guys, um, I'm Andrew Levy. I'm a medical officer in anesthesia, uh, currently practicing in Peter Maritzburg. And this is my approach to a basic GA. So anesthesia has three phases. Uh, we have the induction phase, the maintenance phase, and the emergence phase. I've created a mnemonic based uh, anesthesia memory tool, which I teach to the junior doctors to help them remember when they go out in the field. First is the induction phase. The induction phase mnemonic is stop triple A. Before, before the stop triple A, we need a couple of prerequisites. We need an IV line, and we need baseline vitals. Once we have those, we can go into the mnemonic phase, stop triple A. S for suction, suction in your right hand, no suction, no induction. T is for your tube, for your ET tube. This gives you the opportunity to select your tube size and to tell your anesthetic nurse whether you're doing a rapid sequence or an elective sequence induction. As a male, I'm going to use a size 7.5 tube, for the patient with a potentially full stomach, and thus I'm going to do a rapid sequence induction. So Misa, we're going to do a rapid sequence induction with cricoid pressure. Cool. So with regards to the O in the stop mnemonic oxygen, we need to pre-oxygenate our patients. There are three methods to pre-oxygenate patients to recruit the functional or residual capacity. The first being three vital capacity breaths of 100% oxygen. The second being breathing 100% oxygen for 25 minutes. And the last being to make sure your end tidal oxygen is more than 80%. So I've preset my ventilator. I'm going to pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen. Holding the mask gently while the patient's awake. I want to pre-oxygenate my patient for an, to an end tidal oxygen of more than 80%. Then we come to P, which is my pharmacology, um, which are pre-calculated doses with a rapid sequence induction that I have a colleague that's going to help me give the drugs. With regards to the P, it stands for pharmacology. If you're doing a rapid sequence induction, then we're going to have pre-calculated doses and if we're doing an elective sequence induction, then we're going to titrate our induction aid. Um, with the rest of my mnemonic is triple A. Triple A is important because the A stands for APL valve. Your APL valve must be open. If your APL valve is not open, then you're going to cause your patient a lot of distress when you pre-oxygenate them. The second A stands for antibiotics. We want to give antibiotics 30 minutes before skin incision and thus we give it at the beginning of the anesthetic. And the last A is to remind people to keep the patient asleep with gases. I found that a lot of people forget to keep the patient asleep once they've intubated. My practice is to give the first breath post induction with a, a volatile agent so that they do not have awareness. That completes our induction phase of the mnemonic. We now move on to the maintenance, the maintenance phase of anesthesia. My mnemonic for this is ABCDE, and then we incorporate the triad of anesthesia thereafter. So airway, we want to confirm that our ET tube is in. To confirm our ET tube, there's various mechanisms. Firstly, we listen, we auscultate over the thorax, over the stomach to make sure it's not in the stomach and to make sure that the tube is not down one bronchus. We then look at our capnography to see that we have capnography which is our most sensitive marker of intubation. We can also look at our ET tube for misting. We look for chest rise in the patient and these are mechanisms to ensure that the patient is intubated correctly. Move on to the breathing part of the algorithm. This is a Probably the, the part of the algorithm that has the most technical aspects that you have to look out for. First thing you have to look out for is CO2. You want to keep the patient normocarbic, so in a basic GA between 4 and 6 kPa. We then look at our max pressure or peak inspiratory pressure. With an LMA, we want to keep this below 20 so we do not inflate the stomach as this low esophageal sphincter to tone in, uh, is overcome over 20 centimeters of water. In a, with an ET tube, if you're going above 30 centimeters of water, 
you should be wary that there's um, a problem with obstruction and the max pressure you should ever encounter is 40 centimeters of water. We then think of our respiratory rate. For a general GA, this should be between 12 and 16. Our peak for a basic GA should be between 5 to 8 or 5 to 10. Our inspiratory to our expiratory ratio for the basic GA should be 1 to 2. When we look at our FiO2, it should be minimum 40% for a junior anaesthetist to ensure a, safety, a margin of safety. And we want to ensure that our FiO2 is keeping our sets above 94-95%. Um, we then look at our inhaled anaesthetic agent and we want to titrate that to our MAC to, depending on the depth of the anaesthesia. Uh, when the patient is being stimulated by surgical stimulation, they should be at, at one MAC at least, um, obviously depending on the blood pressure. With regards to C is our circulation. Under circulation, I think about four things. I look at my ECG to make sure there's no arrhythmias. I look at my heart rate to tell me if the patient is tachycardic or aware or um, any abnormalities. I look at our blood pressure. If you think of our starting map and what our map targets are, and I think about my starting HP. Put the HP here to remind myself that if the patient has a low HP and they might bleed, that we might need to order blood early. So moving on to disability, um, it fits into the triad of anesthesia, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, but this is just to remind us that we have given a muscle relaxant and we don't want the patient to be aware. So we want to make sure that the patient has sufficient hypnosis on board. With regards to the E and the ABCD of the maintenance phase, E stands for exposure. Look at a few things. We want to ensure that our patient's pressure points are protected, um, specifically ears, nose, heels, arms. We want to make sure the patient's eyes are taped so that, so that they do not um, get damaged during anesthetic. We want to ensure that the patient has some sort of forced air warmer to keep the patient warm and the patient needs a temperature probe uh, so that we can monitor the temperature intraoperatively. So part, of the, part of the maintenance phase, part of the, after the ABCD mnemonic is to think of the triad of anesthesia. This is to remind us to ensure that we have covered all our bases. Hypnosis, muscle relaxation and analgesia. So with hypnosis in a basic GA, you'll be using a volatile anesthetic to keep your patient deep. With regards to muscle relaxation, you may have used succinamethonium for your induction. Depending on the type of operation, if it's a caesar cesarean section, they might require you to top the patient up with a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, such as rocuronium. With regards to analgesia, we're going to use a multimodal approach using analgesics from different classes such as opioids, non-steroidals and other drugs such as ketamine. Coming off the maintenance phase, I think of two aspects that are not included in the triad and that is fluids and post-operative nausea vomiting. Fluids in adults um, is not the same as in children. In children, if I um, anesthetize a child, I always make sure that I have a number in my head not to exceed. Um, as you do not want to overload the patient. The same as in adults. Um, patients that are fluid behind or hypovolemic might need more fluids than others. In terms of post-operative nausea and vomiting, we can use the upfall score to calculate what the patient's post-operative nausea and vomiting risk is and give drugs accordingly. They would be dexamethasone or Honda and Citron if your hospital has them available. So this covers our maintenance phase of the anesthetic, we go through our ABCDE and we think of our triad with fluids and post-operatism and nausea and vomiting. So now this brings us to our last phase of the anesthetic, we've talked about our induction phase, our maintenance phase, we're now going to talk about the emergence phase. So the mnemonic for this phase is gross and the reason being is when you wake a patient up it's always gross, there's a lot of spit, a lot of blood, perhaps in the ET tube, uh, hopefully not in the ET tube but in the airway from an intubation and thus the mnemonic gross is applicable. You'll see that it's gross with two O's and that is for a reason. So the first thing 
you need to remember when waking a patient up is to turn your gases off. When you get the hang of it, you'll learn when to start turning the gases off so that the patient wakes up in time. The R stands for reversal. You need to make sure that the patient is firstly reversible with your nerve stimulator, and secondly, that you've given the correct dose of reversal when your patient wakes up. With regards to the O, it's the same as when we intubate the patient. We want to pre-oxygenate the patient because the induction phase and the emergence phase are times when you might need to re-intubate the patient. And thus, we're going to look for the same parameters for pre-oxygenating the patient, pre-extubation. Putting in an OP airway um, is advisable. Patients that bite on their tubes can get negative pressure pulmonary edema, which is not something that you want at a district or a rural hospital. You want to ensure that you've suctioned your patients correctly so that they do not have saliva, which could cause laryngospasm when they wake up. I ensure that I put the OP airway in before I suction because suctioning is very stimulating and the patient might bite the tube. The last thing you need to remember is that the patient should always be spontaneously breathing. This ensures that the patient will be able to support their own airway and they, not, um, they do not have too many opiates on board that may impede their stimulus to breathe. And this brings us to our last phase of the anesthetic, the emergence phase with the gross mnemonic. A purposeful movement to safely extubate them so he's reaching for his tube or if he opens his eyes. So I've deflated the cuff of the tube so I'm going to extubate him. An important step to remember here is to put them onto manual spontaneous and to make sure your APL, APL valve is open. Very important post extubation is to put the mask back on the patient and the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, you want to give the patient oxygen. But secondly, and more importantly, if the patient has a spasms, they may have chest movement and it looks like they're breathing, but they're not moving air. So to ensure that they're moving air, we need to look at our ventilator to make sure that they are moving carbons and producing CO2. You can see that this patient is doing that. Once your patient's been successfully extubated and brought to recovery, there are a few important things to note and to hand over. Firstly, you need to connect all your monitors. Those are your SATS probe, your ECG, and your blood pressure. Once that's been done and your first vitals are stable, you need to record the time of your first vitals in recovery and hand over to the nursing staff. Important things that you need to hand over is what kind of anesthetic the patient had. For example, our patient had a general anesthetic we used an endotracheal tube. For analgesia, we used morphine. That's relevant because the patient could become apneic from it. Okay. We gave the patient a muscle relaxant, but fully reversed. And the patient was awake and alert when we extubated them. You need to also tell nursing staff if, if there's any intraoperative issues, how much blood was lost, and how, many, how much fluids were given. Check that your pain scripts have been written up and that all your documentation is complete.